thank you, Natasha, and um, <clears throat> uh, people from organizing this uh, information session. So I'm happy to contribute. Um, actually, I was just called by Radio One uh, to comment on the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, which is also a bit in my field, which is in the uh, catalysis field. So the, the Nobel Prize has been given just like an hour ago to the organocatalytic uh, discoveries of certain people. So my field is catalysis. Uh, and a catalyst is, is a material that has the ability to kind of uh, speed up reactions and also come back unharmed so you can reuse it and reuse it. Um, so my ERC story starts in uh, 2016. Um, actually, the idea I had for the first time was in 2015. And in 2016, I decided to write it up as an ERC, um, partially to also uh, qualify for a professorship position because at that time, I don't know how it is today. Uh, if you had an ERC, you could also start uh, as a tenure track in KU Leuven. So that was a good option. And um, so the idea was written up when I was a FWO postdoc. Uh, I did my PhD in Leuven, and then I went to Caltech in the US for a while for a, a postdoc, very independent from Leuven. I came back and then um, I decided to apply for this ERC. Um, I didn't make it the first time, so I got a B um evaluation in the first round so i could not go to the second round and i had to wait uh, one year uh, at that point i was a phd plus three so uh three years after my phd just at the beginning of my eligibility let's say for erc starting grant um, and the main comments in this proposal which were actually very detailed and very good the, the feedback from the erc was that uh, it was uh, very fundamental and high risk but that it was not corroborated so um, the fundamentals or the reasons why I think that this idea would work were not uh, fundamentally uh, explained and also uh, the feasibility was deemed very low uh, because of the high risk. They thought it was like a blue sky ID but without any backing. Um, so after that um, I was lucky enough to find a tenure track position in KU Leuven uh, without ERC to start uh, my professorship and then uh, I uh, almost like two weeks after I got the rejection from ERC, I repackaged the project uh, or a part of the project and I submitted it to the FWO projects. And then I was lucky uh, the first round to get uh, some money, let's say, to find much more preliminary uh, proofs and uh, let's say feasibility. And with that in mind, uh, I had the luck of for one or two years uh, to work really on experimental proof to, to make my claims much stronger. Uh, and then I had the choice uh, whether I would resubmit in 18 uh, or 19. Uh, but I decided uh, since 19 was the last year that I could resubmit, that I would just wait until the final chance I had and to go with a big bang, let's say, that uh, my CV would be at one year stronger. And also, if I would have failed in 18, I would also not have been able to reapply in 19. So it didn't really matter. I, I considered it. I had one more shot. And if they didn't want this ID uh, in the second time, I would never apply again with this ID. So in the starting uh, grant call. So in 19, um, I decided to, to resubmit this ID. So this ID um, was already from 2015 in my head. So it's uh, something I have thought about for a long time. But only when you start to write uh, a project like this, you really think about everything. And that is... Uh, so the main thing, uh, the main lesson I've learned is that you really need some time to really think through these ideas. And that's what I just did not do in 2016. I just submitted, let's say, the Blue Sky ID without really thinking a lot about it and building a project, let's say, around 10 lines in my head, uh, but very fast and not really corroborated. So in 2019, uh, the ERC call for a starting grant of 2020, I took much more time to think about it. Uh, but still in the writing, I uh, started too late. So as my previous speaker, uh, Peter, was mentioning, you need your time, take your time. I uh, failed to do that because I'm a, a bit of a deadline person. Uh, so I work much faster and better when a deadline is approaching. So I started uh, to think about it in August, about putting it to paper. And then uh, the last two months were really, uh, yeah, really, really busy. So I remember the last weekend before the deadline, rewriting a lot of it. Um, and my wife and the kids going to another place to, to not interfere with my uh, writing. So I would say start early enough. Uh, let's say you need at least, I don't know, two months 
full time to to really get a decent proposal. So at that point, um, for for the B one and the B two, I can give you some of my advice, but this is just personal. So um, the B one, I really wrote. Uh, thinking about these panel members, looking at their expertise, and it's maybe one of the 10, or I don't know how many there are, um, really has an expertise in my field. So all the other nine are really skilled scientists, chemists, physicists, but they're not really um, in my field. So you have to write a B1 really for them uh, to convince people that are not in your field, that your field is valuable, that the challenges are very real, and that what you propose will solve it. So, um, my biggest help for writing this B1 was uh, a friend, which is a physicist, nothing at all to do with my field, uh, who works in IMEC. And he really read my B1 each time I wrote, let's say, uh, a page. And he said, yeah, but what does this mean? I, I don't understand. So I made it so that in the end, he could understand everything in this B1 because he's a, uh, yeah, a tenured chemist or a tenured physicist, but he's not at all in my field. So you have to write it really for... Um, experts but in different fields uh even though they're of course in the panel of the field where you will submit they're still not really specialist in what you do of course you could have the luck or the unluck that there is a specialist uh, in the panel of what you're doing um, but for the b1 it's really important to focus on a broader um, set of people that can understand your proposal and then um, the b2 of course is much more easy to write so even though it's 15 pages it's three times the amount of uh, paper you have to fill um, it's much more like a classic project that you have written already uh, for let's say fwo projects or more technical um, type of applications so there you can really mention a lot of details and methodology and feasibility um, so that was the big um, difference between these two in my b1 i took about two pages of the five um, to make the state of the art understandable to the yeah, to the panel members. So it took a lot of um, basic explanations to really get to a, a clear definition of what the problem is so that my solution would also be perceived as really worthy. Because uh, if you start with a high, let's say really good ID, but you have no idea of sketching um, it in the problem context or what is it going to solve it's yeah it makes less sense so that was the um, the major strategy I took I took about two of the five pages explaining the problems rather than the science I was proposing and then only two pages I explained my ideas and in the last page I took a lot um, of space to talk a little bit about feasibility and uh, risks so um, feasibility I can say that I had uh, some some good preliminary proof from this running project so I would always add some preliminary data in your proposal or uh, some pictures of some, some setup you have built. I'm in the engineering field, so you have some pictures or you have some uh, raw data that can really um, make your claim that it's already feasible or feasible in a way. Because that also was one of the main comments in 2016 that it was not feasible at all. Uh, so they can hardly say it's not feasible if you already did a part, let's say, of the ID uh, in the lab. Um, and then, so I would say um, one of the mistakes I made also in 2016 was that I, I thought my new ID was maybe um, not enough to fill five years or to fill like a big project like ERC. So I lumped in another ID uh, in this project and I had like a dual split um, let's say proposal which had two sides and these two sides were not well connected so my advice would be go for the one big id and work around that rather than to let's say put two ids together because you think it's not um, big enough for an erc or a, a type of project like erc where you get um, a lot of means and five years so focus on the main ID. Um, and i must say that i was very happy to see the feedback of erc so i have in the end you get i got 19 pages of 10 referee reports uh, with detailed feedback about certain work packages, about certain IDs, uh, feasibility, et cetera. So, and that was really good. So if you have time to apply, let's say early on in your um, PhD plus three or plus four, uh, it would also be good because you get a very good feedback uh, from ERC from like, uh, I had 10 referees on the 2020 call and I think six referees on the 2016 call. And in 2016, there was, um, I didn't go to the B 
to the second round. So for the first round, I got like five. And then in uh, 2020, when I received the grant, I had like uh, 10 referees or more uh, commenting on my project. I also did not go to the interview because it was canceled because of COVID. Uh, so everything was on paper. Uh, but that was fine for me. So and then in the end, indeed, uh, you get an email in July. Uh, and then like the same day, you get 20 more emails uh, from all kinds of people. So that's kind of a funny way uh, in your holidays. So I would say try to uh, really think about new ideas and focus on um, on staying to staying true to the main ID and not trying to put in too much different parts which may be connected to this project. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think that's it. In the end, just try to go for it. Don't be afraid to to try to submit a project, especially if you're in PhD plus two or three or four. You still have time to fail and come back as I did. So uh, why not try? Good luck. <laughs>